next stop was Arles, a town whose strategic location and amazing, even magical light have attracted so many throughout the centuries. We had coffee in the Place de Forme, where Roman columns stand next to the Café Nui, made famous by the Van Gogh painting. Walking down a small street just off the Place de Forme, suddenly Les Arènes appears before us, the Roman amphitheater that sits as the heart of the city. And we're in Arles. We are indeed in the very, very heart of the city. And at the Hotel Dieu. And we know Van Gogh lived in Arles for about 15 months. Tell me what's significant about the Hotel Dieu. Well, this is where he came, or this is where he was brought rather, after he had sliced his ear off, after a big fight with Paul Gauguin. And uh, the two gentlemen had shared the yellow house for a couple of months, and they there was a lot of arguing, they didn't get on very well. And so Paul Gauguin decided that he was going to head back to Paris. And uh, so he set off and uh, Vincent followed him, went back, back home to the Yellow House and that's where he cut his ear off. And so he'd wrapped the ear off, uh, wrapped the ear yeah. up and he'd given it to somebody that he knew. And she then called the police. And of course they went round to the Yellow House they found Vincent in a pool of blood and thought he was dead, but he wasn't, and so they brought him here to what was then the, the town hospital. The hospital. Yeah. And where would his room have been? So when he was brought here, the men's ward is just up, up here on the upper floor, so just next to us here. And, and what would his view have been like? Well, this, this actually would have been his view. Exactly. Fun funnily enough, oh. because previously, this, as I say, this had been, uh, this was a medical establishment from 1573 up until present day. And so it changed in the, in the early 1980s. Uh, this is what it looked like when it was still a hospital. So as you can see, it does look fairly clinical, yes, fairly medical. Yes, much more so than now. Much more so than now. But anyway, so the, uh, the Ville d'Arles, the, the town of Arles, decided that when this, uh, this was going to be closed as a medical facility and would be turned into a library and a media centre, therefore they took Vincent's painting and oh. they recreated it. So they recreated so the exactly arches. So exactly recreated. And uh, yes, put in the flower beds again. And so we're seeing it today exactly as he would have seen it when he was here, when he looked out of his window, just up here, into the courtyard, and this is how he would have seen it. Oh, that is that is marvelous. Having seen the painting many times, but now to actually stand and what what we saw is is wonderful. Yep. I know he was only in Arles for about 15 months, and I did a little research and and read that he produced over a quarter of his total portfolio, about 200 paintings, in those 15 months. Is that true? No, he was very, very productive, yes, because also what, what he did was he would go out every day into the countryside and he would paint. He would paint straight onto the canvas. He didn't believe in preliminary sketches. He just what he saw, he committed to canvas immediately. And so that was how he was able to be so productive. And then following his stint here in, in Arles, he then checked himself into the asylum in saint paul de Mossol, close to Saint-Rémy. And he was, um, he was only there for a year, exactly 53 weeks. Uh, but he was even more productive there because of course there he was, in a, uh, he was in the asylum, but they would let him go out to paint in the countryside and in the gardens. Uh, but of course he was supported. He was looked after. Wow. Uh, they, they'd given him three rooms. He had a bedroom, a studio, and a storeroom. Had they recognized room. his genius by then? Uh, he was very. He, um, he was very. His works were not selling. That was the, that was the thing because the taste for his art at that point wasn't there. People were still much more traditional. They wanted much more traditional paintings. Um, this came later, um, but it was so they. They looked after him. They let him paint, which was the most important thing. And so that was, I say, he was even more creative there in a, in a one-year period than he was here in Arles. Can we walk further into the garden and into the painting that I've seen so many times? <laughs> of course. Oh, thank Let's you. Let's go.
Well, so here he would have been looking down at us. That's and we're right. in his garden, a little sadder spot than Giverny for Monet. Absolutely, but... But uh, pivotal to his career and where a masterpiece was created. And as you can see, so it's, been, it's been recreated exactly as, as Vincent would have seen it when he looked out of his, uh, his, his hospital window. So That brings up my question. You called him Vincent. I say Van Gogh, but no one else in Arles says Van Gogh. Tell, teach me how to say it. Well, good question. Being, being British, I say Van Gogh. The French say Van Gogh with a hard G. Gogh. Uh, the, the, uh, the Dutch, and I'm sorry if you have any <laughs> Dutch viewers, I'm going to try it, uh, Van Gogh. So we just well, call him Vincent. I think that's a perfect name. <laughs> Sean, you've brought me to a very historic space, but a space where we're still trying to delve into what makes the French so wonderfully French. What do we love about visiting your country? <laughs> and I look around and I'm seeing familiar and unfamiliar. Tell me what we're seeing here in the... In the Plastiforum. Plastiforum. Well, as the name explains, basically here we have... We've, this is a one spot in all where we have the Romans and Vincent, literally side by side. So, Cluster Forum. This was, uh, this was the forum, which was the center, the nerve center of every Roman town. Uh, this dates from um, the first century BC, and so it was, literally, it was the city hall, or the, the town hall of, of, Ro of the Roman time. So, it was, they were always magnificent constructions. You had all of these columns, the porticos, there was always a temple crowning the forum itself. And so it would have been a magnificent building, taking up an enormous amount of space. However, sadly, of course, like so many monuments, uh, once they ceased to be used, they were just, you know, the sites were just used as a wonderful sort of uh, quarry, if you like, of, of pre-carved stone, pre-carved, pre-engraved sort of worked columns, and the stones were taken and used to construct other buildings. But what is left is exquisite carving well, exactly. so and the, the two columns left. And can I dream that Julius Caesar sat somewhere in this form where we're sitting? <laughs> he, he, was, he was definitely an, in our, so yes, you could absolutely believe that he was here. Yeah, the columns are magnificent. So you have the Corinthian columns with the acanthus leaf capitals. The acanthus leaves, these are plants that the Romans and the Greeks thought were very, very auspicious because they signified life, long life. And it was also a little bit of showing off because they were extremely difficult to carve. Well, and you can tell, it's beautiful. And so, yeah, basically, if you had good acanthus leaf carvings, that showed you paid for the very best stonemasons to be able to, you know, carve your columns like this and so then yes so you then you have the pediment and again exquisite carvings so you imagine that these two columns multiplied thousands of times to build this forum so it must have been magnificent in its day it, it must be I had read that Arles is second only to Rome for the number of standing Roman monuments that still exist, which is amazing when you consider the size of Arles versus the size of Rome. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, Arles, Arles in its day was quite, it was a very important Roman city. Uh, the population was between 75 to 100,000 people. Oh. Uh, so we say, yes, Arles was a very important town. Uh, it was on the Via Domitia, which was the main highway which ran from Italy through across to Spain. And so it was, it was a very strategic hub. For, for the military, for military operations. And of course it had its river trade with the River Rhone running, running through the city. Which um, we'll right be sailing on. Absolutely. So right from the earliest days, in fact from 600 BC, uh, when the Greeks, uh, the Etruscans came to Marseille and then they traveled up river to explore trading opportunities. Fabulous. And they say set up a trading post here in Arles. And so from the earliest days, Arles' prosperity has come from the Rhone River. Well, I'm a Julius Caesar fan. It's attracted his genius, but it's also attracted someone else's genius. Well, so yes, tell me what is behind me. So I me. promised you to say the Romans and Vincent side by side. And so right behind us, we have the Cafe Terrace by Night, the oh. site for Vincent's very famous painting of this cafe. And 
in the original painting, of course, you have the light spilling out onto the cobblestones, but it all comes from this, this lantern. And the rest of the, the buildings, as we see it's with all the other buildings there. around us, are just grey. However, the owners of the, the current owners of the restaurant have painted the entire thing yellow to <laughs> add add more oomph to it. So well, Vincent uh, was known for his yellow. That's it, absolutely. And so uh, this is a beautiful painting. Um, you, he painted it, he set his easel up at the far end of the restaurant, so he looked along up the street. Uh, these, buildings, these, these buildings are still here. And you also have an element of starry night here. So although this isn't considered as one of the Starry Night paintings per se, because it doesn't have it Starry is. Night in the, in the title. Enough perhaps to sing, but it's, I won't. Yes, <laughs> no, it, but, exactly. But um, because it has a Starry Night, it's very often considered as one, of the, as one of the Starry Night paintings as well. Oh, so we're sitting inside another painting. We are indeed. <laughs> the magic of Arl. It, and the magic it, of Vincent. <laughs> Oh, Sean, you didn't prepare me for this reveal. I've walked down a beautiful medieval street to the Roman amphitheater. Well, there we go. It all is a surprise around every corner. History and heritage really come alive here. When was this built? So this was built in about 90 AD, uh, 10 years after the Colosseum, which of course was the blueprint for all of these Roman amphitheaters around the Roman Empire. There were between three or 400 of them throughout the empire itself. And oh. so they were all really scaled down to fit the community uh, where they were located. But uh, I say the Colosseum was... This isn't scaled down too much. <laughs> and having just recently been to the Colosseum in Rome, they're not the crowds. This uh, is... There we go. Yeah. This, this is an ideal, ideal spot. Yeah, no, it's, it's perfect. And as so you can see very clearly, uh, how, how it was built with the, 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 uh, the, the two floors. There was actually a third little floor. And if you come here, if you see this uh, raised area here at the top, this mm -hmm. is called the attic. And this, ran, this was a third level that went all the way around. Oh. And it was very specific and very, very clever because of course the Romans were such amazing engineers. This, uh, from each of these columns between the arches, you had a plinth and then they had poles with ropes that led into the, into the center of the ring. Oh. And then they had canvas sails. So these sails could be pulled over like a retractable sunroof. On a day to protect, like today. Exactly, to protect the spectators below. So sadly, most of this top level, this thing we call, is in, in Latin it was called the attic. Uh, so this would have run all the way around and there would have been one of these posts with the ropes Holding. and the sun sails between each of these arches that, that we see here. I assume that was only on, over the expensive seats. But no, all of the... The entire The entire thing, these, this ran all the way around, so yes. Brilliant. The Romans, masters of engineering. Perhaps they were, they were amazing. And what is so wonderful in Arles, the amphitheater is not just a historical monument in the center of town. It's a working events venue where history lives on. You can watch a show or a performance, knowing that people have done the same for over 2,000 years. And these city walls, who built them? Well, these were originally built by the Romans. And so they enclosed the Roman city of Arles. Aralat was its uh, Roman name, and Latin name. And uh, then they were restored in and uh, rebuilt in the Middle Ages. Oh, so I can touch history. Absolutely. <laughs> Stepping into the present day, we headed to LUMA, the new art center founded by Maya Hoffman and dedicated to the promotion of contemporary art in Arles. Sean, I recognize Frank Gehry, I think. Tell me a little bit about this beautiful building. So Frank Gehry, you're 100% correct. This is the LUMA Tower designed by Frank Gehry and which opened up in June 2021. 
now brand new brand new brand spanking new Frank Gehry, he took he spent time here and he took three local uh, uh, local inspirations uh, to create his design so the the craggy the beautiful facade uh, this is composed of 11,000 stainless steel uh, tiles or panels each one of which is slightly different so that's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful facade. So, but this is based on the Alpeel, which is the, the, the mountain, the, the hill range uh, just outside Arles, ah. uh, where we had the limestone, uh, the limestone crags. It's a very sort of, uh, because of course over the centuries, the limestone has been eroded by the wind and the rain. So you have these amazing crags and outcrops, uh, Les Beaux de Provence, that's, uh, that, that's all part of it. And so he took that as his inspiration for the facade. Now, the, the lower the glass, the circular glass, uh, lower, lower level, which is called the drum, for that he, his inspiration was, of course, the amphitheater, oh. the arena, the arena. And so, as you can see, it has doors all the way around. Mm -hmm. So similar to... I can see the representation. The, uh, I, that's a wonderful segue. Yeah, so that's a, those are the two of the three. And then his third inspiration was our friend Vincent. Oh! Because uh, he was a, he's a huge admirer of Van Gogh's paintings. And so I didn't what he know wanted that. to do was, if you look at the windows, they're very irregular. They're irregularly placed, different sizes. And so when it's nighttime and the building's lit from inside, it creates another starry night. Oh. You have these lights at different angles, Brilliant. different sizes. And so those were his three design inspirations when he came to create. What a perfect way to end a day in Arles. We have seen the Roman structures, we have seen Vincent's spots and his inspiration. Now Frank Gehry, who has melded all three together. You couldn't ask for a more poetic ending. And your explanations have taken me so much further than I had read and studied. And I feel like I've lived through millennia of history. I can't thank you enough. Well, thank you. And we look forward to welcoming you back to all very, very soon. I can't wait. <laughs> See you soon. After a full morning in Arles, we traveled back to Avignon. Having enjoyed an evening stroll around the Palais des Papes the night before, we were looking forward to a privileged access tour of the Palais with Philippe. The building, one of the most significant Gothic structures in Europe, was fascinating. But it was Philippe's tour of the garden that gave me the most insights into the lives of the popes who lived there. Now, we are in the Grand Palace, the Grand Dame, probably Grand Monsieur of Avignon, the center, the Palais des Papes. It is the centerpiece of the city and for many years, the centerpiece of the papacy. I know a little bit about the palace. I know it was built in the 14th century and there were 70 popes when the papacy moved from Rome. But luckily, I have an expert to fill in the blanks and share a lot more information with us today. I'd like to introduce Philippe, who Hello. will share all the history and exciting tales of the Palais des Papes here in Avignon. It's lovely Hello. to meet you. Thank you for lovely coming. Lovely to meet you too as well. Um, tell us about the Palais. Uh -huh. So the Pope's Palace is actually the witness of the presence of the Popes in Avignon in the 14th century. And we have nine Popes living nine in Nine Popes? I read the, seven. <laughs> well, no, nine, and for 100 years. Which, oh, I stand corrected. <laughs> which means that for 100 years, the, uh, the seat of the Catholic Church was here in Avignon. So on March, 9th, 1309, which was a Saturday, if I recall. Oh, very That good. <laughs> day, Avignon won the lottery because that changed the uh, history of Avignon forever. Oh, and so the popes moved here from Rome. All right. Was the palace here at the time, or was there a building, or they erected it from ground there up? There were a few buildings right here where we're standing, where the popes' the palace is standing right now. There was the uh, bishop's palace. And this is actually the building the Pope, the first Pope, 
settled in when he came to Avignon. And at, at first, probably the idea was not to stay too long, okay. to, be, uh, to be honest. But then eventually, uh, the stay uh, became longer, and eventually they decided to have a, a building built that would, that would fit the, uh, the function of the Pope, of course. Or the majesty the of majesty, the papacy. Right, yeah. uh -huh. Can I back up, though? What caused mm -hmm. them to leave Rome? So many political reasons. Uh, the situation in Rome is not good. The city is on the verge of a civil war. Plus, the Pope is having problems with the French king at the time. And beware, in those days, we are not in France. We are in Provence, which oh, is a country of its own. An important distinction. Right. But France was right on the other side of the river. There's the River Rhone that runs through Avignon. And on the other side was France. So it was some sort of a political step. The Pope was getting closer to France. He was showing the French king was, it was, he wanted to show the French king that he was willing to work out all the different issues they were having. And at the same time, the situation in Rome was not good anyway, so it might as well be somewhere else. So it was in, in part a power play. I, we could mention right, many yeah. current events that were similar, but we'll stay out of current politics. Uh, yes. <laughs> so they built the palace then. Mm -hmm. 18 years. In 18 years. 18 years. Yeah, and what's standing here today is as it was yes, pretty, at, uh, pretty after much, the end of 18 years. Pretty much. The building was built in 18 years, then it became the house of the Pope. During all the, the time they were in Avignon, when they left Avignon to finally go back to Rome, this was used by the ambassadors of the Pope. Uh -huh. And throughout uh, the seven, uh, 15, 16, 17, 18th century, and that's only uh, during the French Revolution that this was actually taken away from the Pope. We didn't ask the Pope his, <laughs> his, uh, his opinion, we took it away from him. And, um, we uh, turn it into barracks for soldiers for a moment. Okay. And now this is a place that you can visit, but this, this is also the convention center of Avignon in the, in the building and there are the archives of the region. Rem remember that this is the biggest Gothic structure in Europe. Uh, it's as big as four cathedrals or 2.5 uh, soccer fields. Oh, it is huge. Well, it we climbed huge. enough steps to get up here that I'll, that I'll believe you. <laughs> yes. It, it's like magnificent to, um, to come to current day pretty quickly, and we'll back up in some of the more historic facts. But you were telling me about the Arts Festival through July. Right. Tell me how it's used as an arts center. Ah, well, that started in 1949. Uh, there was an uh, art exhibition in the Pope's Palace, and they decided to have a few plays in the Pope's Palace. And uh, so they did it, and it did so well that they decided to renew the experience the next year, and then the next year, and then the next year. And then it started growing, growing, growing. And uh, in 1949, they represented, they performed uh, three plays. And this year in 2022, uh, they performed all over the city 1,500 plays. Through the month of July. Throughout the month of July. It, last night we came up and were visiting, uh, walking around the courtyard outside the palace and now hearing about the plays and having spent the evening walking out there, it's very organic to the city. It's living. It's still a living palace. It may be a gothic structure, but it, it, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. magnificent in it's, that it is your centerpiece in Avignon, right, but it is integrated. It's the heart of the city. This oh. is, uh, yeah, this is the building here. This is, people know it, be the people meet in front of the Pope's palace. This is, uh, imagine in the, in the in Second World War, Avignon got bombed, not for a long time, but it got bombed. And the place the people felt the safest was actually the Pope's palace, which oh. you can see way above in the sky because it's so big, but somehow it wasn't for a them, it was no for them. It was just if there was a, a safe place in Avignon, that could only be the Pope's palace. And so people rushed into the Pope's palace. Oh, that, that's good. And they were safe. And here. they were safe. Yeah. Oh, that is wonderful. <laughs> um, I'm hopping all over the place and my apologies, but it, you can't help but notice except for some exquisite frescoes. It's empty. Yes. And I've read one of the popes was rather a lush, love luxury. <laughs> Maybe yes. not just one, you can correct uh, me. Uh, there was one. There was indeed one, Clement V, who was the, the fourth pope of Avignon, who was considered to be the, uh, uh, how would I say, the, um, the, the, the fancy, posh kind of uh, Maybe connoisseur pope. is a better word. Right, yes. <laughs> but uh, he was the one having the huge uh, banquets in the Pope's Palace. We know that he had 
300 pounds of gold ware, a pure uh, 24 carat gold ware uh, right. that he would eventually mail to have some, uh, some cash if he needed some. <laughs> uh, oh my God. And uh, he's the one that actually got most of, the, most of the frescoes that survived, and you can see nowadays, were painted during his, his, period. Uh, his period. And uh, yeah, it was, oh. uh, it, it was, the, uh, it was the, the big one. Have the yeah. artifacts, the decorative arts been lost or do we still have Well, them? the rest is just like, uh, like anybody else. Popes are just like anybody else. In the end, when, you, uh, when they move and they go to another place where they take the furniture with them. So when they went back to Rome, we, we have the uh, inventory. Oh, uh, they took, yeah, They took everything back to Rome. And then there were so many pe different people living in the post palace that the, the furniture would renew, the tapestries, the the chairs, whatever, and so uh, that's been a constant change and French Revolution and soldiers, so mm -hmm. that's why it's true there's not much left to see, but uh, when you tour the Post Palace, there's also, uh, there are images, computer images that you can oh. look at where you, uh, you get to see how the Post Palace and used to be. And yeah, visualize when it was fully decorated. Movies. Oh, that's fascinating. <laughs> so I, the building itself it, is fascinating, but it would be wonderful to see. Can you show me around sure, the palace? Sure, of course. Yeah, the tour of the Pope's Palace is a real trip back in time. Oh, thank <laughs> you. This has been a great introduction, and I'm looking forward to exploring right. now. Well, my pleasure. Let's oh, go. Oh, thank you. kitchens mm -hmm. and this doesn't look like any of them ah. but I trust you so explain <laughs> where we are so that looks like a regular room when you first enter yes but then you look up and then you see oh. that we are in a fireplace so we're not really in the kitchen we'd rather we're in the oven we're oven. in the middle in of the, the middle oven of the oven this on is on a actually, day that it's a hundred degrees outside <laughs> thank you very much you're welcome so it feels <laughs> to make you feel what they might have <laughs> felt in those days because imagine that place with a big fire right in the middle with Going 10 up. cows roasting. 10 the, cows. Yeah, the, the, the heat must have been unbearable. But why wouldn't, why wouldn't you do for the Pope, right? So, uh, but uh, yeah, this is where they would roast, they would prepare the meat for the, for the Pope. And they had two rooms like this one. That wasn't the only kitchen, they had two ovens. <laughs> two so they, rooms like right. this with heat going full time all summer, right. all winter. Which means that they could eventually have 20 cows roasting at the same time for the uh, guests of the, uh, of the Pope. It, it is impressive to look up at the chimney. Yes, it is, uh, it is about uh, uh, 45 feet high. Oh. What so do you want to show us next? <laughs> I'm ready to get out ah, of the oven. We might have a look at the gardens as well. Where I've, would they get the vegetables? The gardens sound much cooler. Let's All try right, that. Let's go. Philippe, so no, these okay. are the Pope's gardens. Are right. these how they were in That's medieval times? That's pretty much the way they were in the uh, 1300s. Obviously, we don't have uh, any uh, pictures of the Pope's palace. The very first uh, painting of the Pope's palace was actually made in the 1500s. So you can imagine 200 years later. A little but, different. Uh, what we are gathered from the uh, uh, accounting books and, and, and stories as well and books, we know that it was pretty much this way, which is very nice, very tidy, all everything very well organized. Can we go down and walk through them? Yeah, sure. That One, sounds two, much better. <laughs> Thank you. So, Philippe, these are the Pope's gardens, as much right, as you know correct. how they were in the Middle Ages? This is, yeah, pretty much the way they, uh, they were, and they were, uh, that's the place where the Pope would relax, and that's the place also where they would grow vegetables and fruits and uh, herbs as well, which were very important in the Middle Ages. What uh, is this plant? So this one is marshmallows. I haven't heard uh, of marshmallows. And uh, they would use it, uh, they would use the stick 
to, uh, for the babies to chew on for when their teeth are hurting. Oh, okay. But I wonder how many babies were living in the palace with the popes? <laughs> ah, that we don't know. You mean like sons and daughters? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not No, no, no. The Pope didn't intimating. have any sons and daughters. He only had nephews and nieces. Oh, thank you. Thank you. How proper. <laughs> how proper. And then, for example, they would burn this underneath the cradles. That's Tansy. And in the Middle Ages, they thought that if you burn this in the cradles, the baby will, uh, would grow uh, healthy and educated and handsome, pretty. So that was really a, that was a great thing so to do. Is, I'm going to take some home for the grandchildren. <laughs> I'm sure they don't need them. Now, I recognize <laughs> lavender, of right. course. Uh -huh. Ubiquitous in Provence. Exactly. So but lavender. It's the same in the time of the popes. Exactly. That's a, that's a local plant. And this is a soothing plant. It's relaxing. Uh, when you are bitten by your bee, you can put it on the, put on the sting. Yeah, and it's I uh, didn't soothing. Know that. Uh, rosemary, uh, which is yes. very good for your stomach, and they say as well that it's very good for your mind. Ah. And there's a tradition in Provence that say when you are when you are taking the, your driving test, you have to get a, a piece of a rosemary in your pocket, and that's how you're going to get your driving license. Okay, I know a lot that's of American teenagers <laughs> that want that. Yeah. And I see fruit trees. Were they? Yes. Is that typical uh -huh. that the popes had fruit trees? Yes. There's a lime. Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah, there were all types of different trees, cherry trees, apple trees, but also limes and uh, pomegranates and oranges. Those were fancy trees that uh, not everybody could afford. So, of course, that was always a, it was a, a, a good sign for the pope to have those trees in his own garden. Uh, good sign or bad sign, depending on ah. what the population knew. <laughs> right. But this is such a perfect solarium for the plants. They could probably grow year-round. Yes, they do. They do. Ah. And then, then uh, right here, there's just a few, a few, a few uh, flowers that uh, grow on very arid and dry uh, uh, land. And, uh, yeah. and, and the some... popes could look down from their windows right. and enjoy their gardens when they didn't want to walk in them. Mm -hmm some vines as well there are some vines here and there because again wine was the uh, was the main uh, beverage in the uh, in the middle ages they wouldn't drink water uh, you'd never know what i mean the water was not and very, they must uh, have safe. had their own vineyards outside the, the palais mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but they had the grapes here mm -hmm. as well and uh, yeah there's a there's a fountain as well over there which is the symbol of the four rivers that run in uh, eden in heaven so the idea as well is to uh, try to recreate what heaven, uh, heaven might have been uh, or what they thought heaven w looked like in the 1300s. In the garden. Yeah. Well, I must say they've captured a little bit of heaven, except maybe the temperature. <laughs> and I imagine yeah. somewhere else is this temperature today. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, well, you can imagine how, it must, how hot it must be down there if it's hot up here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one way to look at it and one way to inspire people to behave. <laughs> Thank you. These You're were welcome. gorgeous. And you learn such a glimpse of the life of everyone when uh -huh. you see what they're growing. Mm -hmm. Back up the stairs. Yes. brought me to the very top of the Palais des Papes on the very hottest day of the year. You're welcome. But I'll forgive you because it's been wonderful learning about the palace, the history, the gardens, the kitchen. It's been beautiful and the view from the top is worth it. I can't thank you enough. Well, my pleasure. I, uh, I love it. If you enjoyed it, that's that's what the uh, tour of the post Palace is as well, just to try to understand how people could live back in those days because those were not uh, easy days. So uh, it's, uh, that's how we get to, uh, we learn and, uh, and we see that uh, we're actually quite a good, better, we're better off now in the 21st century than in the 14th century. Thank you again though for everything and I hope our guests will come and see more of the palace than we could show them today. But there's so much more here. But I'm going to end my visit looking at this gorgeous view out at the river we're going to be sailing on.
ending our day in Provence, after traveling virtually through millennia of history from Roman to medieval to the present day, we're going to go back to Roman history and end at the magnificent Pont de Garde. The Romans built it in the first century AD, and I could use many words to describe it, but I think Henry James, when he traveled through Provence, described it best, and I paraphrase. It was built at a time that the Romans were only capable of greatness. And I think you'll agree.